Come on. Come on. Do you want to sit on my lap? Do you want to sit on my lap? Yeah. Come on up. Lolly. That's Lolly, everyone. And, oh, good. She's going to join us, I think. One of you, I think I've quick feet indeed. You were very quick with identifying the puppy on the seat. So uh, I'm very glad that she's going to be with us. And she does look like a puppy, but she actually isn't. She's almost, I think she's almost 70 years old in dog years. She's a very good dog. Uh, her name is Lolly. My name is Gildert. And I'm an actor and I'm an audiobook narrator and I have started reading fireside readings of some of my favorite books to you since coronavirus hit uh, in the hope that it'll give you a little companionship and I've been thoroughly enjoying doing it and at the moment we're in the middle of The Awakening by Kate Chopin and the heroine of this book her name is Edna, and I have to apologize because my father's name was Edgar, and I have a Pavlovian response when I start saying Ed, I, out of my mouth has regularly come, as I'm sure you've all noticed, Edgar, as opposed to Edna, so uh, that's why that happens, and uh, I'm going to try to not have it happen again, but I'm sure it will happen again, so I apologize for it. But it is quite nice because it brings my father into the equation. He used to love to read, and he read to me. And then when he was uh, sadly getting very old, uh, and just before he died, I went back to England. I was living in America at that stage. I went back to England, and I read to him. I read to him the one of the books we read, uh, the Hound of the Baskervilles. He had read that to me when I was a kid. And um, we sat in front of the fire, and I'm sure that partly I'm thinking of him when I'm doing this, and that is probably why I keep on saying Edgar instead of Edna. Edna is in a little bit of a pickle. What's wonderful about this book is it's so subtle. You sort of have to read into it what's really going on. Um, but she is acting out a little bit with her husband. Um, I think safe to say that she's infatuated in love with Robert, although nothing ever happened between them. Um, but he left early. Uh, we might suspect that he had similar feelings for her, but she's now back in New Orleans, and I was told that I needed to pronounce that New Orleans, um, and uh, she's back there, and she's acting out, um, or just trying to get out of the constraints that she feels she is in. So welcome to a fireside reading with Lolly, if you can see her down there, of The Awakening by Kate Chopin, chapter 19. Edna could not help but think that it was very foolish, very childish to have stamped upon her wedding ring and smashed the crystal vase upon the tiles. She was visited by no more outbursts, moving her to such futile expedients. She began to do as she liked and to feel as she liked. She completely abandoned her Tuesdays at home and did not return the visits of those who had called upon her. She made no ineffectual efforts to conduct her household en bon ménagère, going and coming as it suited her fancy and, so far as she was able, lending herself to any passing caprice. Mr. Pontellier had been a rather courteous husband so long as he met a certain tacit submissiveness in his wife, but her new and unexpected line of conduct completely bewildered him. It shocked him. Then her absolute disregard for her duties as a wife angered him. 
When Mr. Pontellier became rude, Edna grew insolent. She had resolved never to take another step backward. It would seem to me the utmost folly for a woman at the head of a household and the mother of children to spend in an atelier days which would be better employed contriving for the comfort of her family. I feel like painting, answered Edna. Perhaps I shan't always feel like it. Then in God's name, paint, but don't let the family go to the devil. There's Madame Ratignol, because she keeps up her music, she doesn't let everything else go to chaos. And she's more of a musician than you are a painter. She isn't a musician and I'm not a painter. It isn't on account of painting that I let things go. On account of what then? Oh, I don't know. Let me alone. You bother me. It sometimes entered Mr. Pontellier's mind to wonder if his wife were not growing a little unbalanced mentally. He could see plainly that she was not herself. That is, he could not see that she was becoming herself and daily casting aside that fictitious self which we assume like a garment with which to appear before the world. Her husband let her alone, as she requested, and went away to his office. Edna went up to her atelier, a bright room at the top of the house. She was working with great energy and interest without accomplishing anything, however, which satisfied her even in the smallest degree. For a time, she had the whole household enrolled in the service of art. The boys posed for her. They thought it amusing at first, but the occupation soon lost its attractiveness when they discovered that it was not a game arranged especially for their entertainment. The nurse sat for hours before Edna's palate, patient as a savage, while the housemaid took charge of the children and the drawing room went undusted. But the housemaid too served her term as model when Edna perceived that the young woman's back and shoulders were molded on classic lines and that her hair, loosened from its confining cap, became an inspiration. While Edna worked, she sometimes sang low the little air Ah, si tu savais. It moved her with recollections. She could hear again the ripple of the water, the flapping sail. She could see the glint of the moon upon the bay and could feel the soft, gusty beating of the hot south wind. A subtle current of desire passed through her body, weakening her hold upon the brushes and making her eyes burn. There were days when she was very happy without knowing why. She was happy to be alive and breathing when her whole being seemed to be one with the sunlight, the colors, the odors, the luxuriant warmth of some perfect southern day. She liked then to wander alone into strange and unfamiliar places she discovered many a sunny, sleepy corner fashioned to dream in, and she found it good to dream and to be alone and unmolested. There were days when she was unhappy. She did not know why, when it did not seem worthwhile to be glad or sorry, to be alive or dead, when life appeared to her like a grotesque pandemonium and humanity like worms struggling blindly toward inevitable annihilation. She could not work on such a day, nor weave fancies to stir her pulses and warm her blood. Chapter 20. It was during such a mood that Edna hunted up Mademoiselle Ries. She had not forgotten the rather disagreeable impression left upon her by their last interview 
but she nevertheless felt a desire to see her, above all to listen while she played upon the piano. Quite early in the afternoon, she started upon her quest for the pianist. Unfortunately, she had mislaid or lost Mademoiselle Reese's card, and looking up her address in the city directory, she found that the woman lived on Bienville Street, some distance away. The directory, which fell into her hands, was a year or more old, however, and upon reaching the number indicated, Edna discovered that the house was occupied by a respectable family who had chambre garnie to let. They had been living there for six months and knew absolutely nothing of a Mademoiselle Rhys. In fact, they knew nothing of any of their neighbours. Their lodgers were all people of the highest distinction, they assured Edna. She did not linger to discuss class distinctions with Madame Poupon, but hastened to a neighbouring grocery store, feeling sure that Mademoiselle would have left her address with the proprietor. He knew Mademoiselle Rhys a good deal better than he wanted to know her, he informed his questioner. In truth, he did not want to know her at all or anything concerning her. The most disagreeable and unpopular woman who ever lived in Bienville Street he thanked heaven she had left the neighbourhood and was equally thankful that he did not know where she had gone. Edna's desire to see Mademoiselle Rhys had increased tenfold since these unlooked-for obstacles had arisen to thwart it. She was wondering who could give her the information she sought when it suddenly occurred to her that Madame Lebrun would be the one most likely to do so. She knew it was useless to ask Madame Ratignol, who was on the most distant terms with the musician, and preferred to know nothing concerning her. She had once been almost as emphatic in expressing herself upon the subject as the corner grocer. Edna knew that Madame Lebrun had returned to the city, for it was the middle of November, and she also knew where the Lebruns lived, on Chartres Street. Their home, from the outside, looked like a prison, with iron bars before the door and lower windows. The iron bars were a relic of the old regime, and no one had ever thought of dislodging them. At the side was a high fence enclosing the garden. A gate or door opening upon the street was locked. Edna rang the bell at this side garden gate and stood upon the banquette waiting to be admitted. It was Victor who opened the gate for her. A woman wiping her hands upon her apron was close at his heels. Before she saw them, Edna could hear them in altercation, the woman, plainly an anomaly, claiming the right to be allowed to perform her duties, one of which was to answer the bell. Victor was surprised and delighted to see Mrs. Pontellier, and he made no attempt to conceal either his astonishment or his delight. He was a dark, proud, good-looking youngster of 19, greatly resembling his mother, but with ten times her impetuosity. He instructed the woman to go at once and inform Madame Lebrun that Mrs. Pontellier desired to see her. The woman grumbled a refusal to do part of her duty when she had not been permitted to do it all and started back to her interrupted task of weeding the garden whereupon Victor administered a rebuke in the form of a volley of abuse, which, owing to its rapidity and incoherence, was all but incomprehensible to Edna. Whatever it was, the rebuke was convincing, for the woman dropped her hoe and went mumbling into the house. Edna did not wish to enter. It was very pleasant there on the side porch, where there were chairs, a wicker lounge, and a small table, she seated herself, for she was tired from her long tramp, and she began to rock gently and smooth out the folds of her silk parasol. Victor drew up his chair beside her, 
he at once explained, that the woman's offensive conduct was all due to imperfect training, as he was not there to take her in hand. He had only come up from the island the morning before and expected to return next day. He stayed all winter at the island. He lived there and kept the place in order and got things ready for the summer visitors. But a man needed occasional relaxation, he informed Mrs. Pontellier, and every now and again he drummed up a pretext to bring him to the city. My, but he had had a time of it the evening before. He wouldn't want his mother to know, and he began to talk in a whisper. He was scintillant with recollections. Of course, he couldn't think of telling Mrs. Pontellier all about it, she being a woman and not comprehending such things, but it all began with a girl peeping and smiling at him through the shutters as he passed by. Oh, but she was a beauty. Certainly he smiled back and went up and talked to her. Mrs. Pontellier did not know him if she supposed he was one to let an opportunity like that escape him. Despite herself, the youngster amused her. She must have betrayed in her look some degree of interest or entertainment. The boy grew more daring, and Mrs. Pontellier might have found herself in a little while listening to a highly coloured story, but for the timely appearance of Madame Lebrun. The lady was still clad in white, according to her custom of the summer. Her eyes beamed an effusive welcome. Would not Mrs. Pontellier go inside? Would she partake of some refreshment? Why had she not been there before? How was that dear Mr. Pontellier? And how were those sweet children? Had Mrs. Pontellier ever known such a warm November? Victor went and reclined on the wicker lounge behind his mother's chair, where he commanded a view of Edna's face. He had taken her parasol from her hands while he spoke to her, and he now lifted it and twirled it above him as he lay on his back. When Madame Lebrun complained that it was so dull coming back to the city that she saw so few people now that even Victor, when he came up from the island for a day or two, had so much to occupy him and engage his time, then it was that the youth went into contortions on the lounge and winked mischievously at Edna. She somehow felt like a confederate in crime and tried to look severe and disapproving. There had been but two letters from Robert with little in them, they told her. Victor said it was really not worthwhile to go inside for the letters when his mother entreated him to go in search of them. He remembered the contents, which in truth he rattled off very glibly when put to the test. One letter was written from Veracruz and the other from the city of Mexico. He had met Montel, who was doing everything toward his advancement. So far, the financial situation was no improvement over the one he had left in New Orleans, but of course the prospects were vastly better. He wrote of the city of Mexico, the buildings, the people and their habits, the conditions of life which he found there. He sent his love to the family. He enclosed a check to his mother and hoped she would affectionately remember him to all his friends. That was about the substance of the two letters. Edna felt that if there had been a message for her, she would have received it. The despondent frame of mind in which she had left home began again to overtake her, and she remembered that she wished to find Mademoiselle Rhys. Madame Lebrun knew where Mademoiselle Rhys lived. She gave Edna the address, regretting that she would not consent to stay and spend the remainder of the afternoon and pay a visit to Mademoiselle Rhys some other day. The afternoon was already well advanced. Victor escorted her out upon the banquette, lifted her parasol and held it over her while he walked to the car with her. 
he entreated her to bear in mind that the disclosures of the afternoon were strictly confidential. She laughed and bantered him a little, remembering too late that she should have been dignified and reserved. How handsome Mrs. Pontellier looked, said Madame Lebrun to her son. Ravishing, he admitted. The city atmosphere has improved her. Some way she doesn't seem like the same woman. Chapter 21 some people contended that the reason Mademoiselle Rhys always chose apartments up under the roof was to discourage the approach of beggars, peddlers, and callers. There were plenty of windows in her little front room. They were, for the most part, dingy, but as they were nearly always open, it did not make so much difference. They often admitted into the room a good deal of smoke and soot, but... At the same time, all the light and air that there was came through them. From her windows could be seen the crescent of the river, the masts of ships, and the big chimneys of the Mississippi steamers. A magnificent piano crowded the apartment. In the next room she slept, and in the third and last she harboured a gasoline stove on which she cooked her meals when disinclined to descend to the neighbouring restaurant. It was there also that she ate, keeping her belongings in a rare old buffet, dingy and battered from a hundred years of use. When Edna knocked at Mademoiselle Reese's front room door and entered, she discovered that person standing beside the window, engaged in mending or patching an old prunella gaiter. The little musician laughed all over when she saw Edna. Her laugh consisted of a contortion of the face and all the muscles of the body. She seemed strikingly homely, standing there in the artificial light. She still wore the shabby lace and the artificial bunch of violets on the side of her head. So you remembered me at last said Mademoiselle. I had said to myself, ah, bah, she will never come. Did you want me to come? asked Edna with a smile. I had not thought much about it, answered Mademoiselle. The two had seated themselves on a little bumpy sofa which stood against the wall. I am glad, however, that you came. I have the water boiling back there and was just about to make some coffee. You will drink a cup with me. And how is La Belle Dame? Always handsome, always healthy, always contented. She took Edna's hand between her strong, wiry fingers, holding it loosely, without warmth, and executing a sort of double theme upon the back and palm. Yes, she went on, I sometimes thought she will never come. She promised, as those women in society always do without meaning it, she will never come. For I really don't believe you like me, Mrs. Pontellier. I don't know whether I like you or not, replied Edna gazing down at the little woman with a quizzical look. The candor of Mrs. Pontellier's admission greatly pleased Mademoiselle Rhys. She expressed her gratification by repairing forthwith to the region of the gasoline stove and rewarding her guest with the promised cup of coffee. The coffee and the biscuit accompanying it proved very acceptable to Edna, who had declined refreshment at Madame Lebrun's and was now beginning to feel hungry. Mademoiselle set the tray, which she brought in, upon a small table near at hand and seated herself once again in the lumpy sofa. I have had a letter from your friend, she remarked as she poured a little cream into Edna's cup and handed it to her.
My friend? Yes, your friend, Robert. He wrote to me from the city of Mexico. Wrote to you? repeated Edna in amazement, stirring her coffee absently. Yes, to me. Why not? Don't stir all the warmth out of your drink. Drink it. Though the letter might as well have been sent to you, it was nothing but Mrs. Pontellier from beginning to end. Let me see it, requested the young woman entreatingly. No, a letter concerns no one but the person who writes it and the one to whom it is written. Haven't you just said it concerned me from beginning to end? It was written about you, not to you. Have you seen Mrs. Pontellier? How is she looking? He asks. As Mrs. Pontellier says... Or, as Mrs. Pontellier once said, if Mrs. Pontellier should call upon you, play for her that impromptu of Chopin's, my favorite. I heard it here a day or two ago, but not as you play it. I should like to know how it affects her. And so on, as if he supposed we were constantly in each other's company. Let me see the letter. Oh, no. Have you answered it? No. Let me see the letter. No, and no again. Then play the impromptu for me. It is growing late. What time do you have to be home? Time doesn't concern me. Your question seems a little rude. Play the impromptu. But you have told me nothing of yourself. What are you doing? Painting, laughed Edna. I am becoming an artist. Think of it. Ah, an artist. You have pretensions, madame. Why pretensions? Do you think I could not become an artist? I do not know you well enough to say... I do not know your talent or your temperament. To be an artist includes much. One must possess many gifts, absolute gifts, which have not been acquired by one's own effort. And, moreover, to succeed, the artist must possess the courageous soul. What do you mean by the courageous soul? Courageous, ma foi, the brave soul, the soul that dares and defies. Show me the letter and play for me the impromptu. You. you see that I have persistence. Does that quality count for anything in art? It counts with a foolish old woman whom you have captivated replied Mademoiselle, with her wriggling laugh. <laughs> the letter was right there at hand in the drawer of the little table upon which Edna had just placed her coffee cup. Mademoiselle opened the drawer and drew forth the letter, the topmost one. She placed it in Edna's hands and without further comment arose and went to the piano. Mademoiselle played a soft interlude. It was an improvisation. She sat low at the instrument and the lines of her body settled into ungraceful curves and angles that gave it an appearance of deformity. Gradually and imperceptibly the interlude melted into the soft opening minor chords of the Chopin impromptu. Edna did not know when the impromptu began or ended. She sat in the sofa corner reading Robert's letter by the fading light. Mademoiselle had glided from the Chopin into the quivering love notes 
of Isolde's song and back again to the impromptu with its soulful and poignant longing. The shadows deepened in the little room. The music grew strange and fantastic, turbulent, insistent, plaintive, and soft with entreaty. The shadows grew deeper. The music filled the room. It floated out upon the night, over the housetops, the crescent of the river, losing itself in the silence of the upper air. Edna was sobbing, just as she had wept one midnight at Grand Isle, when strange new voices awoke in her. She arose in some agitation to take her departure. May I come again, mademoiselle? She asked at the threshold. Come whenever you feel like it. Be careful. The stairs and the landings are dark. Don't stumble. Mademoiselle re-entered and lit a candle. Robert's letter was on the floor. She stooped and picked it up. It was crumpled and damp with tears. Mademoiselle smoothed the letter out, restored it to the envelope, and replaced it in the table drawer. Thank you all so much for joining me. I hope this helps a little. And I very much look forward to seeing you tomorrow, same time and place, 5 Pacific, at Fireside Reading. Check out any chapters that you've missed at the Fireside Reading channel on YouTube. Until then, please be very well. Good night.